Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from a brand new author to the show, and by the name of Drew the Unquestioned, from over on Reddit, No Sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further, and why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. I work for the DNR in a special unit that deals with dangerous cryptids. This is one of the methods we use when someone is attacked by Dogman. Let's get straight into that. I suppose it's about time I told this story. I'm not getting any younger, and I think it's a story that needs to be passed on, considering the state of the world. This was in my early days at the DNR. That's the Department of Natural Resources, of course, in a unit jokingly called the Night Stalker Unit. It was our job to deal with the cases deemed CZE, that's classified zoological entities. Anything found in a natural world that requires special care and diplomatic contingencies. Dogmen, Sasquatch, Mere folk, any of those entities which defy scientific conventions, display an intelligence similar to our own, or present a formidable threat to our species, which requires a high level of discretion and tact on our part. If someone has an encounter with a CZE, that's not something we look into, other than to make sure they haven't gathered any evidence that might compromise the CZE's privacy. What concerns us are the cases of negative contact, if a company is attempting to develop an area which is causing distress to the local CZE population, or if one or more hunters have been attempting to catch or kill a CZE, if a family or town has been targeted by one or more CZEs in a dangerous way, or, as was the case, I will describe here, someone turned up dead in an apparent attack by a CZE. This case happened in 83 back when I was still a greenhorn working under Connor Doncliffe, my mentor and a legend in the parks and wildlife crowd. We were called out to a park area known as the land between the lakes, over by Kentucky and Tennessee. This was a fairly popular area for hunting and hiking and camping. It was before the big summer rush that a family had parked their RV in the campground located in the northern part of the area to begin what would have been a perfect family summer camping trip. And what they got instead was a nightmare beyond anything they thought possible. And a report came to us about eight hours after a local had found the family dead. By then, the local police and park rangers had gone over the whole terrible scene. And the family had been butchered, ripped to shreds by either a wild animal or an axe murderer. They didn't know, which is how it ended up on our desk. And Connor and I went to the scene and tried to smooth things over with the locals. Get them busy with crowd control and patrolling. Anything to minimise the trauma they would experience having to process a scene like this. And the campsite looked like a killing floor of a slaughterhouse. The father was laying just outside the door of the camper, split down the middle. The shotgun at his side had only been fired once, and based on evidence hadn't managed to hit anything but dirt. Inside the camper, the little boy was in pieces all around the main living area. He couldn't have been a day over eleven. Further in the back we found the mother, in the bathroom at the rear of the camper. The door to the bathroom had been torn off its hinges and crushed like a tin can. And we found offensive wounds on her, and so she had tried to put up a fight, at least. Now Connor was the one who noticed that there was clothes and dolls for a young girl, and the camper as well. We searched the area, hoping and praying that she got away and hid somewhere. And we found her not 40 yards away, 20 feet up in a pine tree, torn apart and struck there on a branch the way shrikes will stick bugs on a black thorn. And I had never seen something so terrible before. Connor looked like he was about to faint or lose his lunch. I'd never seen him so mad. Now that we had both gathered ourselves, we started in on our case. All evidence pointed to a dog man attack, what we called a black dog case in the DNR and the father had been drawn out, most likely by a noise or a tap on the camper. Once he was dispatched, the mother and the children barricaded themselves in the bathroom, 
and the sea said he tore the door off, killed the mother, and proceeded to drag the children out to be slaughtered. McConnor was convinced there had to be more than one, which meant this wasn't a rogue loner. It meant that this was a serious threat to the people in the area. Something had to be done, and I had no idea what that might mean. After we made sure the teams had everything under control, we went back to the motel we had rented in the area. I remember Connor spending most of the night on the terrace outside, smoking like a chimney and looking like he was considering something truly unpleasant. The next morning I couldn't be sure he'd ever managed to sleep, but he looked at me hard and told me there was a way this could be fixed, if I had the courage and I was sure I wanted it fixed. I told him I'd do anything to make things right for that family, and he nodded with a condemned expression. He told me to go and fetch supplies for a camping trip, for at least three or four days. And we had tents and lights and things like that in the truck, and so I got food and water and other necessities. When I got back, I saw he had a bag of evidence taken from the scene. And when I started to ask about it, he just nodded and checked the supplies. And we drove further north into Kentucky, deep into the country, where the road turned to gravel and gravel to dirt. We seemed to be following an old logging road. When we came to a fence marked protected land, we left the truck and hiked deeper into the woods for most of the day. On the way, I noticed Connor picking prairie sage by a handful and stubbing it in a bag. And we had brought a bow and a few arrows, and Connor told me to keep an eye out for any game that we could bring down. I spotted a decent-sized jackrabbit, and we managed to bag it, even though I wasn't much of a bow hunter. And it was nearly night when we reached a spot flat and open enough to set up on. At once camp was set up and he got a fire going, he tossed in a handful of sage he had collected. The green leaves created an acrid heavy smoke that permeated the area. It reminded me of my grandmother, who used to burn sage around her house all the time. And I asked him if I should clean the rabbit to make up some food, but he said the rabbit, well, it wasn't for us. I had been running through different explanations for what we were out there to do, but nothing made enough sense so finally I had to ask. And Connor looked up at the red-orange fading light and drew in a deep breath. What we're here to do, he said, is something we do not do lightly. I haven't done it in going on twenty years now, and I don't suppose I'll ever need to do it again. It was taught to me by my grandfather and his grandfather before him, and before him the Indians, who were either taught by their grandfathers or came up with it, on their own. You know that the creatures who were responsible for that horror back at the park only have been around longer than any of us, before the settlers, before the Indians. Our relationship with them has changed throughout a shared history. Sometimes they would have the upper hand and we'd live in fear of the woods, or we'd have the upper hand and they'd be forced back deeper to keep away from our guns and machines. As you know, they are highly intelligent, on a different level than we are I suppose. I believe they were a sort of evolutionary crossroad when the human race split between the thinking society and the primal tribes. They evolved along a different path, a more natural path, you might say. They may not be able to speak our language or build cities like we can, but they are just as sharp, just as observant and adaptive as we are. Perhaps even more so, seeing how they don't even have a language or history is cluttering up their thinking. The point is... They are not animals in the way wolves or bears are to us. Evolutionary speaking, they are on the same level as we are, and because of this we have to consider our relationship with them diplomatically. We don't want to live in fear of them. They want to be left alone. To maintain this peace, the ancient humans had devised a line of contact between us, in the event of some unacceptable event. A way of reaching out and making peaceful contact. Well, obviously, this is not something either side enjoys in any sense. The dogmen have cultivated a powerful distrust of humans over the centuries, and I can't say that I blame them for that. They respect us as a threat, but they despise us as a species. This, of course, is not true of all of them. Like us, there are some among them more prone to peace and coexistence, just as there are others who will wipe us out, given the chance. That is why this contact is extremely risky for us. I remember feeling distant, like what he was saying was bouncing around in my head and I couldn't get a hold of it. 
Was he seriously telling me that we were about to meet with one of the dogmen? A whole pack of them, even? Uh, for what? To talk to them? Ask them for their help? I just sat like a statue as he talked and threw more sage on the fire. Uh, the ritual, which is what my granddaddy called it, was to be followed by the letter. The meeting place is deeper in the woods and we were to bring no tools or weapons or even clothes. Nothing but the offering and the evidence. This would put us completely at their mercy, which is the only way that they would let us get close. And that was the first thing to land in my mind. No weapons, no clothes. I thought he might be trying to kid me, but when I looked at his face, I could see he wasn't just serious, and he was scared. To see a man like Connor in terror, well, it was something I'll never forget. He tossed another clutch of sage onto the fire and gestured to it. Now the sage burning, he said, was part of the ritual. The Indians believed that it would ward off evil spirits in the area. And my granddaddy had a different idea what it was. He got it an old factory beacon of sauce. A strong smell to get their attention, and one they associate with the contact ritual, letting them know we will be attempted at contact. And he lifted a branch of sage to his nose before tossing it into the fire. We waited until the moon was high, and the path was lit enough for us to walk in the dark. I was staring up at the moon through my tent wall when Connor called to me and said that it was time. And I felt my stomach do a gymnastics routine and called out to see the fire was out and Connor was already completely bare. And I took off my clothes, numbly, and went to join him. And I never felt so vulnerable as I did standing in a dark wood, naked and shivering. It wasn't cold, but I imagine I could have been mistaken for a eunuch. I was so nervous. I grabbed the rabbit we killed and sort of clutched it to my chest trying to feel less naked. And before we set out, Connor grabbed a handful of the ashes from the fire and held it out, blowing a puff of soot over me before tossing the rest on himself. And we walked and we walked. It seemed like we had walked until I was sure the sun would be coming up. And until now, the forest had been wet with sound. Birds in the trees, bugs chirping and whirring. The whole orchestra of nature. But at some point, Everything went quiet as a church hall. It was like someone found a volume knob on the woods and turned it off. And I hesitated for a moment until I remembered Connor's instructions. Walk steady and calm. Keep your eyes on the path. Pay no mind to anything you might see or hear. And most importantly, you were not to look at anything if it should look at you. And as we walked, the only sounds were the wind in the trees and the crunch of the leaves beneath us until I started to hear something moving in the woods to our left. Something big. I kept my eyes forward as the sounds trailed us, matching at pace. Then came a sound to our right, a deep, low, guttural growl that made everything inside you shudder and clench. I had heard the researchers mention infrasound, a sort of low-frequency sound that can cause anxiety and feelings of dread in people. They said it could be detected in a tiger's roar, that our reaction to it might be tied to our ancestral fears. Or maybe it wasn't tigers that they were worried about after all. Either way, being there in the dark, and with nothing between them and us, oh, I can't begin to describe the terror I felt. As we walked, the two at our sides kept abreast of us. One of them jumped onto the path behind us and let out another growl that made my teeth vibrate before charging us. I could hear the crash of the leaves through the thuds of its feet hidden in the dirt not two feet behind me. I took everything within me not to spin around and bolt for the woodline, screaming and pissing myself. And I heard it slide to a stop and felt the dirt and sticks kicked up, bounce off my calves. But I just kept walking. And Connor did the same. I couldn't feel my body anymore. But I just focused all of my sanity on walking and looking straight ahead. And when Connor finally stopped, we had come to a clearing. The grass and the prairie sage were a bright silver in the moonlight, which was so strong it looked to be daytime. And for a moment we just stood. The forest was still and silent as a graveyard. And then I caught a glimpse of eyes reflecting the moonlight in the bushes ahead of us. A large shape emerged from the forest in front of us. It crawled forward on all fours, its black fur seeming to absorb all light a living silhouette with two glowing pearls where its eyes should be. Two others emerged alongside it like bodyguards, 
One of them looked like spun silver in the moonlight, and its eyes held a spark like amber when you rub it against wool. The other had patches of black and eyes that glowed like the dying cinders of an old bonfire. I almost broke my composure when I felt the hot breath on the back of my legs and heard snuffling. I twitched involuntarily, and the thing let out another low warning growl before touching its cold nose to my backside, as it sniffed and circled me. Another black shape was circling Connor as well. I couldn't see his face, but something about his demeanor settled a thundering in my ears. And the dogman circled me growled again and tried to look up into my eyes. I looked away quickly, dodging its stare like a nervous kid being confronted by an angry policeman. It lunged at me and I heard the snap of its teeth and felt the rush of air as it bit the air in front of my crotch, sending a shudder through me that made me glad I had emptied my bladder before leaving. A large black dogman eyed us for a moment before shifting. Someone inside it popped like a twig being snapped in a wet towel and it slowly rose onto two legs. The other two followed suit. The two at its sides had been seven or eight feet tall, but the black one had to be closer to ten feet. I had never seen something so massive so close before. It almost blacked out the moon over us. Connor looked at me and made a gesture to the rabbits I held. I felt like I was in a slow-motion terror dream, and my body, well, I wouldn't respond. A low growl behind me snapped me out of it, and I stepped forward. I could feel the eyes on me like hot pokers held inches from my skin, waiting for an excuse to close the gap. I laid a rabbit at the feet of the largest, stepping into its shadow that seemed to be extension of itself, as though I might be stepping into a vast open mouth. A snot came from high above me, and I felt a snuffling at my hair. And to my absolute horror, a nose entered my field of vision, then a muzzle, and then the bright bio-luminescent pearls of its eyes. Something left me in that moment, like it had reached into me and taken something. What it was, I couldn't be sure. I looked away from those points of light in the black mass before me with great difficulty, and then I stepped back, carefully moving to Connor's side once again. The larger sniffed at the rabbit before making a gesture to one of the attendants, who grabbed the hair in one hand. It looked like a gorilla holding a kitten even though I thought the rabbit had been quite large for its species. And then it disappeared into the woods, and Connor took the bag of evidence from under his arm. He began to pull objects out and laid them onto the ground before him. And it was a piece of bloodied cloth, a wedding band stained black with blood, a child's shoe, and finally a lock of golden hair. The Alpha sniffed at the items intently, growling low as it got to the hair. It stood at its full height and watched Connor as he pulled the last items from the bag. A clutch of fur found in a father's hand, saliva samples taken from the bodies, and a small vial of urine-soaked dirt taken near the site. The Alpha sniffed at these items and snorted before grunting and standing. It growled deeply for a moment before turning to disappear into the dark with a brief step, covering the distance to the trees like a cloud passing in front of the moon. The others soon followed, looking back at us with low, warning growls, and after that, they had gone. And Connor and I just stood in shock until the sounds of the forest returned as quickly as they had gone. A great weight seemed to lift off me, and I felt like I might pass out. And Connor took a long breath in and let it out slow, shaking just the smallest bit. He looked at me and then grinned. I think she likes you, he said, and I almost fell over at that. My knees buckling slightly. And the trip back to the camp seemed to happen in double time, like someone rewinding a tape. Once we found our lanterns, Connor and I pulled on our clothes and climbed into our tents without a word. I felt like I might never sleep again, my heart still thudding in my ears. But I ended up falling asleep almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. And the next few days were spent camping and waiting. Connor had told me we had to stay in that area until we had gotten some indication that they had done something about our mutual problem. He told me about the first time before in the ritual of contact. It hadn't been here, though he said he had contacted this pack before. This was apparently something done all over the country. The ritual changes slightly in certain areas, but the purpose, I was the same. 
On the third night, we heard far off howling, deep and piercing, even at a distance. It sounded the way a coyote pack would sing in chorus, all baying and howling and yipping at different volumes and intervals. The next morning, we found, laid on the ground before our campfire, three massive clawed hands severed at the wrist and lined up. And Connor smiled when he saw it. Ah, looks like they took care of it, he said, lifting one to examine it. He handed one to me and it felt heavier than it looked like holding a gun for the first time. The one hand was bigger than both my hands together, and the long claws at the end of each finger had to be five inches, and retracted slightly. And the fur on each was a different colour, and each one was clearly a left hand. Connor dropped each into a separate bag, and said the lab boys would be over the moon about these. They tended to collect their dead fairly religiously, and so remains are difficult to come by. We then packed up and went. We hadn't heard of any further activity in the area, and we told everyone we were authorized to tell that the situation was resolved, and we had performed a highly successful contact. After that, I felt a bit like a celebrity in the DNR. It was something that I'll never forget, and something I wouldn't consider doing again, unless the situation was dire. Although, with the reports we've been getting lately, it might be something we won't be able to do at all anymore very soon. We don't know why, but They've been becoming more active and aggressive lately, but it suddenly makes the continued peace between us more and more unreliable. What that means for the future, well, I can only fear the worst. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. A mighty thank you to the incredible author, Drew the Unquestioned, from over on Reddit No Sleep. I had my eye on this one months ago, Drew, and I'm so glad you allowed me to narrate it on the channel. I really hope you enjoyed my rendition, and I certainly will keep my eye out for any more of your work in the future. Well, guys and girls, I already know you sank your teeth into that one and can't wait to hear more. But as ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you can pen a story packing that much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. Well guys, quite possibly one of the best Dogman stories I've ever read off of the Reddit platform, and I'm sure you'll agree with me. That was incredibly accurate and chest pounding fun. As ever, I hope you're all well and happy, your family and friends alike. And you're all looking forward to a wonderful Christmas just around the corner. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. I suppose it's about... I suppose it's... I suppose it's about time I told this story. I'm not getting any... Oh, fucking hell, fam, get a grip, motherfucker. I suppose it's about time that I told this story. I'm not getting any young, I'm not getting any young, no, 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 Sick, fam, sick, sick.